Hi guys, Chris Parkin here and I'm going to do a video on Photoshop and Lightroom and going beyond a single image. Um, this is taken from a talk that I did at the Taranaki Interclub um, competition which was their 50th celebration um, this year but it's also based on some of the stuff that uh, my students do in 206 uh, for SIT, Southern Institute of Technology um, and it's also based on my own personal workflow so um, if you're listening to this and you're not a member of SIT then hopefully you find it useful and if you are then then hopefully it's it's um, useful and, and quite specific for you as well. Um, it is the, the 200 level so if you're looking if you've managed to run across this and you're doing 100 and you go what? <laughs> Don't panic um, that course builds you up to, to this level. Um, anyway let's let's get stuck in and, and see where we go. So when I'm doing um, composite work it tends to be for something like a portfolio um, in fact, that some of this is based on images that I've put together for attempted fellowship for PSNZ, which I unfortunately didn't get, but um, such is life. Um, but hopefully it's still useful. So planning and getting the idea um, is usually the first step, and that can, can actually be the longest um, part of the process. And then looking at getting source images, and when you're doing that you're looking at things like resolution and lighting, and we'll go into these in more detail. Um, then I'll bring everything into to Lightroom. Um, I do most of my editing um, in Lightroom, um, whether or not that's panoramic stitching or, or the basic editing. And then I get stuck into Photoshop um, and concentrate on non using non-destructive techniques, which means that if I run across something later on that I haven't got right, I can always go back and fix it and change it, which is quite nice. And then I tend to pull it back into Lightroom for any final finishing touches um, and then you export and double check it. Now that's a nice simple version of it. What it tends to more look like <laughs> is this. You go round and round in circles all over the place, um, particularly between finding the source images and then changing your idea because it hasn't worked um, and that last loop between doing your basic editing and exporting and double checking seems to happen a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, forever going back and, and looking at things and seeing what stands out over time. And really if you are doing work, um, particularly with portfolios, the longer that you can give yourself to digest um, the, the images um, and look at what you've done and make sure it works, um, it, the better. So um, often I find personally I hate having put in 10 hours of work on an image and then find that I've stuffed something up and I go, oh, I can't be bothered. Actually, if I leave it for a day, sleep on it overnight, come back to it, then I can be bothered to fix up that a little bit because I know it's going to irritate the living daylights out of me if I don't. And I know that the chances are somebody who's marking it or looking at it is going to spot it. Um, and uh, I, I like to make my work as, as realistic as possible. Now, the good news is, that most of my editing um, is straight ACR or um, Adobe Camera Raw or in Lightroom and then um, double check and export it. I don't do all of my work as as composites but um, so so even if your your normal workflow isn't um, isn't doing composites and um, then at least I, I hope that you'll get something out of out of this anyway. Um, so, part of the planning process, first thing I will look at is story. What is the story that I'm trying to tell? What is the idea that you're trying to communicate um, to your viewer? If you don't have one of those, then you tend to be starting off on the back foot. Um, you're just doing it for the process's sake. It's not a great way of, um, of approaching it. The next thing I tend to do is try and make it real. It doesn't. Sometimes I go for a surreal look. Um, but generally, when you're putting things together, you want to be making people go, how did you do that? Was it photoshopped? Really? Um, and the, the best thing that I can think of for that is there's a, or um, well, there was two years ago, a very large Lego mini figurine um, that was made out of fiberglass um, wandering around, I think it was Switzerland's coast or something. Um, and you never quite knew whether or not somebody had photoshopped those images or if it was a huge fiberglass um, minifigurine until they tipped it over and you could actually see the fact that it was fiberglass. Um, but if you can do that type of effect and people are wondering whether or not it's 
fiberglass or, or photoshopped then um, then it certainly helps to, to bend that reality um, and I've popped a, a thing on here and sometimes you can let the effect for effect's sake run away from you um, it doesn't always and I'll come back to that again in a bit um, another thing to do is, is to get inspiration and that can come from other artists from YouTube from Google um, from other photographers and the the challenge is that you're not doing a direct copy of stuff um, but generally it's, there's a lot of, of resource in there that you can draw multiple ideas from um, next step is planning for composition so this is when you're actually taking your images and you're just giving yourself enough room to crop in if you need to um, to make sure that you're using those leading lines rule of thirds is always a good place to start um, and generally you have your uh, subjects looking into the image unless there's a really specific reason that that's not um, the case um, and oh yeah story <laughs> just to remind you from that again um, so when I said don't let the effects run away from you this image is one that's almost entirely based on effect um, it was done as I was doing a, a video for um, Heart Art Society and their um, art exchange with the sister city in Japan, Amino, um, and we were putting something together and I was busy doing multiple hours of, of video work of other artists doing life drawings and I got thoroughly sick and tired of um, watching everybody else do their painting um, of this model and I decided to go home and actually do something as a portrait um, from the from the photo and as you can see the background's not great at all but it's the nice thing about when you're doing work with Photoshop I'll go back a second um, you don't have to keep the same background but you do need to make sure that the image is nicely in focus and in enough detail to work from um, and there's something like 400 triangles in here most of them are tied up in the eyes because that's where we're drawn to so um, this prints out quite nicely and the, you can keep looking into that eye there's more and more detail as you get closer and closer um, so I enjoyed doing that anyway so um, source images um, for camera club then you need to be using your own work and that's the the end of that story and that's the downside of the telephone going. Um, so yeah, with camera club work, um, it, everything needs to be our, your own work, including overlays. And um, in theory, the um, effects that you can put in with, say, like Nix, where you put a border on, that border should actually be a photo of your own border. I, they've not been particularly strict on that at the moment, but um, really that should be the should be the case if you're obeying the letter of the law on that one. However, with your own practice and your own study work, um, then you can use your own work, you can use Creative Commons images and public domain images. If in doubt, um, particularly if you're studying, don't, um, because you will find uh, that there are penalties tied into um, to the assignments if you, you use work that you're not supposed to be using. Um, and for the SRA students, make sure that you say that it's your own um, assignments, uh, your own photos if you're using them for your assignments as well. So Creative Commons images, there are a couple of ones that are useful. Um, the Creative Commons attribution and the Creative Commons non-commercial attribution, um, which are fairly self-explanatory. You have to say that you've utilised the work from that person, um, which is fine. Um, there's a slightly more mm, interesting version where you've got a share alike uh, a requirement with them and that means that if you're going to utilize their images they say that you then have to actually also keep them so that other people can share them and work on them um, whether or not you feel happy to do that is up to you um, but you then can't utilize um, other images that um, that have a non-share alike um, challenge with them um, so that there are some that yeah you, you can't utilize together um, but if you're wanting more information on that drop me an email and I'll, I'll find you the reference for that specifically and then there's these ones which have no derivatives or no derivatives um, and you can't utilize these at all 
because the the definition of making a derivative is simply copying them and pasting them into another document that's actually making a derivative. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting one there. Um, definitely not something you can use for, for Photoshop. Okay, so how do you find these? Well, <coughs> Google has this nice little tool that if you click on labeled for reuse, um, then you can find the, the labeled for re re reuse with modification. Um, and that's usually the, the easiest one to, to find. Um, you might want, you may well want to use the non-commercial because if you're not selling the images, then it's, then it's not a, um, an issue either. Um, but yeah, that's a, a nice, easy, nice, easy way to find those. You do want to actually link through to the actual website that they're coming from, um, because sometimes Google will pick up something that's not a um, actually copyright, uh, having the appropriate copyright. But generally, it's pretty good. Okay, so image size. Well, it depends on what you're going to be doing with it. Um, and this comes down predominantly to prints versus projected. If you're doing projected or displaying on a computer screen, then I generally recommend you start with about double the number of pixels that you're going to have in your final image. So for SIT, you're looking at 1,500 pixels on the longest side. You want to have about 3,000 in your original. And it just makes light. Um, life easier when you're doing masking and things um, that you're less likely to end up with jagged edges. If you're doing camera club work then you're probably looking at 1620 um, on the the width and 1080 on the height um, so double those for for what you're looking at. Um, when you're doing prints then you want to be playing with something that's at least 300 dpi or dots per inch. So if you're taking an 8x12 uh, then your longest side is 12 inches which is the easiest one to work with. Um, 12 times 300 is 3600 so you want to make sure your image is 3600 pixels um, at least. Um, preferably, preferably more if you can if you can get it, um, but yeah, that tends to be maxing out most cameras. Um, however, it's not always that simple. <laughs> this is um, an image that I've, well, it's a version of an image that I s submitted for my fellowship and didn't get it, um, and it is, uh, this this particular version is the same as I've submitted for the Muriel Hopper, which is a Welling, uh, lower heart based um, competition and managed to get into. Um, but this is printed out 12 inches high. Um, now when it's fully done it's 12 inches um, for uh, six pitches um, and it's cut into six six pitches down um, and three across. So when I actually print it at full size, which I haven't, um, it's going to be 72 inches long, which is pretty darn huge. Um, that means that the working size of the file ends up being 2160 pixels long. It's an absolutely massive file and it actually just about killed my first, my other computer. I was running off a, a laptop that was about four years old and ended up having to get, get a desktop just so I could do this image um, because it was taking basically five minutes to do anything and um, when I stitched the first image together it took three lots of six hours to um, do it in, in bits. <laughs> so um, when you get up to massive sizes um, then yeah your computer can, can end up um, quite struggling. This particular image is something in the order of two, uh, 100 pitches in the background image stitched together um, and then there are a lot more uh, other objects added on top of it so um, yeah they can they can get fairly massive massive so um, next thing we need to look at is lighting and there's four main options option one is take all your images at the same time you can stick your camera on manual um, both in terms of exposure and color balance and you keep the lighting the same and you can get it done quite easily. Um, it means that you've got very little to have to um, generate or control later on. And particularly if you're just doing a single picture with, say, four or five elements, whether or not they're 
uh, Lego minifigs or um, people that you're adding to uh, um, and shrinking them down, then if you can take them all at the same time, um, it makes life a lot easier to, to do one image at a time and build up your portfolio that way. Um, the other option is that you can take your images to match the base image, so you find your background that you really like and then you have either a copy of that with you or have a really good mental picture of it, work out where the lighting's coming from, and we'll come into that in a bit, um, and take your photos to match that. Um, option three is find the images that match the base images, or um, option four, you can adjust those images to match. Now, option four is probably the hardest option, um, but it can be quite helpful, and we might get into that. Uh, at the end of this particular um, workshop uh, video, I might end up doing another one on that, which I haven't um, covered in, in a huge amount of detail. We'll talk about the others as we go, though. Okay, so what are you needing to match? Well, you're needing to match the light direction, the number of light sources, the type of light, and the color temperature. Um, now, if you have multiple light sources matching that color temperature, uh, can be a lot more complicated, um, but we'll go into that in a bit. So, sometimes lighting direction is really easy to work out. You can see where the shadow is, you can see where the person is, and you basically draw a line between the two, and that tells you where your, your sun is, and you can work out where that lighting direction is. So, if you were then to try and add something to that image, um, and you're going to Photoshop it in photorealistically, you'd make sure that the lighting's coming from the same direction. This one, we can't see the sun, um, but we can see both the shadows on the ground, and nicely, um, there's a bit of mist in the gr in the air, so we can actually see the line within the, the air down here that the light is actually casting. Um, so again, really easy to work out where it's going. How else does light change? Well, it changes from soft light to hard, and there's lots of different ways of that happening. Um, a good example of a hard light is a small torch uh, light will give you a really firm shadow. Sunlight, um, being a very, very large light source but incredibly far away, will give you the same type of hard light. Whereas if you've got a diffused, overcast sky, um, then that can give you a, a very a very diffuse light, um, or softboxes. Um, the larger the softbox, the closer the softbox is to the object, then the the softer that light's going to be as well. So if you've got a, an image that's taken under a really cloudy sky, and you're trying to put it in a scene that's got strong sunshine on it, you're going to seriously struggle to get the two to match, simply because the lighting doesn't match. Even if the even if the light's coming from the same direction, um, you've got shadows and things that are going to behave differently. Um, and again, I'll, I'll have a go at uh, doing a video for, on that um, as an extension uh, as we go, but yeah, for the moment it's much easier if you just make sure that you find images that that actually match. So these two would not be images that you're going to try and um, put together because the, the angel um, or cherub has very soft light and it's coming in from multiple windows but generally from the top um, whereas Caesar has very strong hard shadows on, on winter's light um, and it's coming in from the side, and you see from the easiest way to spot that is the the shadow that the knee's casting. Um, but you can also see the same thing happening over the side of the face as well. So color temperature, you've probably come across this when you're looking at color balance in, of your images. Um, <coughs> something like a candle flame is going to be a very warm image, and a clear blue sky is going to give you uh, a very cool color. So if you've got um, light coming in from the window um, on one side and you've got, uh, which is blue sky light that's been reflected in, and then you've got a, say a light source like an LED or, an, um, or a lamp, then that can cause some really weird color shifts um, in your images and trying to match those and then put them in becomes really difficult. Um, so again, it's a case of making sure that your lighting matches as closely as possible, and that's why option one, take the photos all at the same time, is often the easiest way. 
um, because then even if you do have direct sunlight on one side and your shadows are being filled with that, that clear blue daylight um, but a lower intensity it's going to keep that balance similar um, which is which is quite a useful technique. Okay, so how do you change the color balance if they're not quite right? Well, you can simply use your sliders in Lightroom um, and you've got temperature and tint and those are your two main ones. It makes a huge difference when you pull your your color temperature across as to what the image feels like. So that one feels quite cold and remote. Um, this one feels much warmer. Um, it also kind of feels like an old image as well because of the the way that we interpret um, the way that photos age. Um, but I don't like don't particularly like either of them. In fact, I'm going to go back to this one for a second. Um, and this one's got a glitch in it. I wonder if anybody spotted it. See the um, the headland here uh, has actually been grabbed from the um, from the grasses. And so, while Lightroom was doing a reasonable job of stitching the rest of the image, it mucked that bit up. Um, so, in the next one, I cropped it off. <laughs> um, and sometimes you sometimes you can redo it, and sometimes it'll behave itself. Sometimes it won't. So for this one I actually ended up want, um, wanting quite a different feel to it and try and bring out some of the colours in the sunset while also getting some of those those shadows to have the, the richer blues and to do that it was a cr cross between using the colour temperature and some split toning um, and adding a bit of hue or colour back in um, and that Im or a version of this image did reasonably well and got into Natex. Um, I think it was actually kept going round and was a bit more of a panorama as well. Okay, so mixed ca temperatures, color temperatures. This image I would not try and fit into anything, um, but it's a good idea to try and work out what what light sources are there and where the lights are coming from. So I'm just going to stop talking for a second, and you can have a think about this. Where do you think the lights are coming from? Right, so you can always pause it if you want it, but there's your red light, and it's coming from straight on, um, and if anything, slightly behind, um, so we've not got it on this side of the nose. You've got a white light which is coming down and casting quite a hard shadow on the um, on the concrete, or not the concrete, on the stone behind, and there's one other, it's the purple one which is coming in from the side and that's quite a soft light. So you've got a huge mix of light sources there um, and yeah trying to to replicate that into anything else is, is going to be a bit of a nightmare. Um, so but it's, it's a good example of, of what happens when you have multiple light sources. Alright next thing you need to look at focus and for any of you wandering around and want a really good example of this not working, have a look at animates. Sorry, animates. Um, but they frequently grab a an object, a, a cat or a, or a child, um, and play with the depth of field really nicely, and then put a background in that's really quite in focus. <laughs> it just doesn't work from a uh, from a technical point of view. Um, so. The idea with depth of field again is to try and keep it real. It's actually much easier to mask the edge of something that is in focus um, than if it's got a soft edge. You can see this one here has a green halo round the back of the Tuatara spike um, and trying to mask that out gets to, to be an absolute pain. Um, but if you have it all in focus and then mask it in photo and then blur it in Photoshop. It's much easier to do. So let's get rid of that one and let's see what it should look like. You're going to end up with something with a with a background that's more out of focus. And I've tweaked the the color balance as well to to match the two a little bit more. Um, but that's going to to give you much more of a a feeling of it could have been real. Um, whereas the one on the the right you look at immediately and can spot that it's actually been it has been photoshopped for, for definite um, and you can see here we managed to get rid of the the green halo around there but it's a, a bit of a fiddle to do so what controls your focus well as obviously it's tied to your depth of field um, 
and that's based on your f-stop, the distance that the object is from the lens and the focal length. So your depth of field is going to get shallower the closer you are to the camera. Um, we'll come to the f-stop in a second. Focal length, the wider your lens is, then the greater the depth of field is. And the last one is your sensor size. Um, in this case, the, the bigger your sensor is, the shallower your depth of field becomes. Um, so that's why often your phone cameras, which use a very, very small sensor, hardly ever have anything out of focus. They might have it blurry, <laughs> but that's another story. Um, but the the depth of field on those cameras is actually quite quite large. Um, so to give you an idea of, of these two, um, this one's taken at f11 uh, and um, there's a falcon actually sitting on my, my glove with a um, 8mm lens and you can see both the falcon and the background are in focus whereas the next one across is a 200mm lens and you can see how the the background's blurred out. There's a little bit of a difference in, in f-stop there but it's not going to solve the problem. Um, it's still going to to give you that um, that greater depth of field on the 8mm and a shallower depth of field on the 200. So one way to deal with that is to use hyperfocal distancing um, and if you've done your uh, 103 recently, you'll have talked about this when you're doing landscapes, and what it is, is with a small, rather than using a small f-stop, which has a shallow depth of field and focusing closer, because then you've still got your outside, your trees in the far distance out of focus, we're not going to use it, we're going to use a large f-stop, but you're then going to focus about two-thirds of the way towards the camera. Now, there are tables and charts that will tell you just how much um, will be in focus depending on how far away that object is and what your f-stop is and what your camera is and they're well worth looking up if you're, you're going to be doing this type of work but generally the larger the f-stop and, fo large f -stop and focus about um, two-thirds the way from the horizon and you end up with things behaving themselves reasonably well um, but if that's not going to work, then there are other options, and one of them is to do focus stacking, which is taking multiple images with different parts of the image in sharp focus and using Photoshop to actually do the masking. Um, now, it does require time to do, generally is worth doing on a, on a tripod. Um, and previously, I'd only ever heard of this being done with macro, um, particularly insects, um, because macro you've you've got the object very close to the lens, so you've got a very shallow depth of field, and getting the whole of a bug sharp is really really difficult. Um, but Peter Eastway, um, who do, who's part of the ND5 group, does it for his landscapes, um, which is fantastic because it means that you can utilize the the same tricks and techniques and have objects that are really really close to you in the foreground just as pin sharp as things far away um, the downside is it's not so good with moving subjects and you have to stay still um, otherwise things things end up being being um, moved comparative to the background and and you end up with um, something called parallax error um, but as long as you don't move, hence the tripod, uh, then it can be quite an effective way of doing it. But again, it does take time. Um, so in Photoshop, reasonably easy, you um, open all your layers in one document, um, edit auto align e layers, edit auto blend layers, and stack images. And it'll take multiple images and put them together and give you a nice depth of field on it. Um, I, this particular one I had to hand hold, I couldn't get the tripod out. Um, so focused in about here, 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 and here. Um, I probably needed one more to to get the back of um, that image in, in focus. Um, that's what, it ends up being one of my pieces of pottery in the end. Um, but yeah, um, it needed a little bit of tweaking to to make sure that Photoshop was actually bringing forward the right piece, um, but it certainly gives you a much better sense of the the pot than than the previous version with the, the much shallower depth of field. 
Okay, so next question. What's wrong with this picture? So hopefully the thing that you spotted is this shell isn't sitting into the landscape and looks really odd. And part of that is to do with the fact that the perspective of it is wrong. We're looking down on the shell, whereas it should be sitting flat on the ground. Um, there are a few other things wrong with it too, but I'll let you think about those for yourself. Um, so perspective is generally your angle of view, but it also um, can affect, uh, can be changed by your lens size and 18mm it will give you some barrel distortion potentially, um, but it'll also give you more divergence and um, the lines leading away as your vanishing points. Um, particularly important in vanishing points with buildings and any any object that's got square lines and things on it. Um, and if you want to do some digging into that, you're not f familiar with vanishing points, then drawing videos are a really good resource for that. Um, and for those of you studying uh, 206, you have some links to, to those drawing videos as well. Easiest thing to fix though is hold down shift when you're resizing so you don't stretch the image. So if you take a photo of a ball and you're resizing it to, to fit it into an, uh, into an image and you grab the side button or, or the corner button, don't grab the side button, make sure you grab the corner. If you grab the corner button and then don't hold down shift as you're dragging that image around, uh, making it larger or smaller, you can end up making it so that it's no longer a sphere, um, and that is something that you tend to, um, the human eye tends to pick up quite easily, and um, it's something that you want to avoid. And same thing with people, um, you, you can make them really thin and skinny, and their faces start to look wrong, um, so again something that you want to avoid. Okay, so we're going to have a look at Lightroom, and this is the CC or Creative Cloud version uh, because it has a couple of very nice features in terms of panoramic stitching and HDR. Um, and the nice thing about both of them is it produces a DNG file or a digital negative file, which you can then still apply all of the tricks and tools um, within Camera Raw, uh, and basically it, it treats it as a raw file. So. Um, this one is using option one, we want to take all those images at the same time, particularly important with panoramas, um, otherwise you end up with lines through your images as, color change, as the colours change. Um, best off to use a tripod, make sure your IS or image stabilisation, um, or I think VR is the, um, the acronym that Nikon use, um, is off. And if you can use a remote trigger, because that means that any camera shake that you've got um, within your your image is, is going to be removed as well. Don't have anything moving in the image, um, because then you can end up with some really weird effects where people's heads got chopped off, and um, you can't play with it, so you end up with the same person five times in the panorama and make a thing out of it. But eh, hence the star there. But generally, you don't want to have anything moving in the in the shot. Um, do shoot in RAW gives you that greater versatility in terms of exposure. Overlap each image by about a third and you can use multiple rows and you do want to use manual exposure so that you're keeping the exposure the same throughout the whole thing. I found, particularly with the lenses that I've got, it's better to use multiple 18mm um, shots, so using an 18mm lens, than using um, the 8mm because my 8 mils of fisheye and it bends. I haven't had the the option of playing around with a, a wide angle lens that doesn't have the fisheye um, and seeing whether or not it can cope with the stitching that way. Um, and if anybody wants to email me back and, and let me know about that one, that would be interesting. Um, and the other is to make sure that you're using color balance on manual so that um, your camera's not, particularly not on auto and, and therefore changing the color balance of the image as you go. Processing, it will take a lot of RAM, particularly if you're using um, more than 10 or 20 images, it starts getting huge. Um, and always double check the the finished file because, as you saw before, sometimes it can dump weird things in, in wrong places. So, how to do it in Lightroom? Well, you've got 
select all your images, photo merge and panorama. Um, so you just right click on one of those images once you've got them all selected and it will go ahead and chug away and take something like that turn it into this and you'll end up with that white area around the the outside. You can now with the, the latest versions um, expand and stretch it so that it actually fills up the corners um, or you can crop in and so that, that choice is up to you. With HDR or high dynamic range again it's important to use a tripod and a remote trigger and not to have anything moving in the image generally. Um, if you've got an auto bracketing function on your camera, well worth using, um, and you can set it to, I generally go with minus um, 2 EV or exposure value. Um, you can go with more, you can go with less, but I'm, I'm shooting on a Sony and it's already got a quite a decent um, dynamic range built in, so if I'm doing it then I'll, it tends to be minus 2. Um, potentially even minus three depending on how bright uh, or how big the contrast is. And what does it do? Well you take your three shots um, this one's EV minus two so it's underexposed and it's given me a nice exposure for the sky. This one's EV zero, yeah some of the water's alright um, and this one's plus two and you can see that the rocks down here uh, are starting to look pretty reasonable there. Um, we've got a bit of lens flare over here, which I never managed to fix from this particular series, which has um, come back to haunt me, but oh, well, I'll have to go back out and play again. Um, I should have had my polarizing filter on and I didn't. Never mind. <laughs> um, so if you use the auto function, it comes up with something like that. If you reset it um, and have a look at the file in Lightroom, just on its own. It'll look like this, but what it's hiding is there's a whole pile of data in these darker areas that you can then brighten up. Um, and the nice thing about that is that you can pick and choose where you want that, that information to come out. There's also more information hidden in those brighter areas as well. Um, and once I'd finished playing with that, that was what the, the final image came out like. And again, I'm kicking myself that I didn't have that polarizing filter on because I might have been able to see through some of the, the water detail, but <clears throat> live and learn. Okay, um, so let's have a look at the basic fixes um, that you can do within Photoshop. And they range from your exposure, color temperature, contrast, crop, and some of the selective adjustments. Now, um, I'm going to pause this here because I've actually already got some videos on um, Photoshop and Lightroom and the different bits and pieces that you can utilize there and they're already available to you so I'm not going to repeat myself too much. There is two things, um, sorry there's one thing that is worth pointing out that's in the new version of Photoshop and, and that's under the effects function and it's dehaze and that allows you to cut through some of the haze and the um, uh, kind of acts like a little bit like a polarizing filter would in real life. Um, it enriches the, the color saturation and increases the contrast. You can overcook it quite easily, so just um, be cautious with it, but it can be quite a useful tool if, you're, if you've got a very hazy day um, or foggy and you want to bring out some more of that detail. And all of these things are available within the selective adjustment layer as well um, and your dehaze is actually moved up to just underneath your clarity. Uh, if you're wanting to see exactly where you've written on or drawn your mask on then you can click the select overlay button um, and, and edit a particular part of that as well. So yeah, quite a quite a nice useful tool um, but again already done quite a bit of work on that so um, we won't we won't go into it with this video. Okay so Photoshop where possible, open and you edit your objects as smart objects. Um, and this is simply because they don't lose resolution and you can apply all the smart filters to them and redo things. And it's about that ability to do things non-destructively so that if you realize you've messed something up, you can always come back and fix it again later. The downside, of course, is that it takes up more file space and your computer be can be slower. Um, you also can't work directly on the layer unless you open it as a uh, in 
uh, Adobe Camera Raw, and then you can do cloning and things um, directly on the, the file. But there are ways and means around that as well. Um, so how do you get things open as, as a smart object? Well, if you're in Lightroom, you simply go right click on the image, open a smart object in Photoshop, sorry, edit in, and then open a smart object in Photoshop. So it'll be, um, if you don't have Nix already loaded, then it'll probably be the third one down. In Photoshop, a file open as smart object, um, or you can, if you've opened it and then you've realized that actually you really want to work on it as a smart object, you can convert for smart filters, um, which is under the filter file. Um, that one's not the most, the best way of doing it because it's technically not the raw, the original raw file that you're working from, but it's um, it's better than nothing, and it also has the advantage that if you then shrink the file down, um, so you you grab the corners and resize it. If it's a smart object, it keeps all that data there. Um, so if you then make it bigger again, you don't end up running into um, that issue of suddenly finding everything's gone pixelated. Um, the downside is if you grab your bright paintbrush and you try and work on one of those um, objects that is a smart on, a, on one of the smart objects, um, so this layer here is a smart object, you can see the, the little symbol there, it'll whinge at you that it isn't um, a rasterized object and uh, um, and the, the rasterization is simply making it pixel based rather than um, in most cases you're talking about lines and the computer um, running things through mathematical equations um, so you don't want to do that what you want to do is you actually create a new layer and you can do your cloning on a new layer and if you happen to need to change things then you, you can always go back and, and sort them out. So in terms of making your selections, lots of ways of doing this and for those of you who've been studying already you'll be quite familiar with the different selection tools. A key thing that I want to show, show you here is sometimes it's useful to use multiple different types of selection tools. So this one was using the quick selection um, and then you take the um, right click, uh, sorry, go into layer, layer mask and hide selection and it'll get rid of the, the background. Well it's got rid of all the bits that we selected. Um, we then need to go and clean up some of the, the edges here. Um, now that's the, the, the transparent area is that checkerboard panel. Um, that's the smart object that we'd already talked about and your layer mask is your uh, the black and white thing here. Now, when you, if you're wanting to edit the layer mask itself, make sure that you actually have this um, set of, of brackets here around the actual layer mask object. Um, so you can just do that by clicking and it will change it. If you don't, then, um, and you don't have it as a smart object, you may find yourself in the unfortunate situation that you've actually drawn on the picture, um, which can be really frustrating. So for this one, to clean it up, just use the polygon lasso tool, did a rough selection except for where the wire got really close and inverted the selection which means that it then goes from um, having the, the center of the selected to everything around the outside and you can see where the, the marching ants have moved and you can then just use a paintbrush and paint over the layer mask or you can um, depending on how you've got your system set up, you can actually hit delete and it will get rid of it as well. Now the key thing to remember with your masks, and you're probably very familiar with it, is white reveals and black conceals. That's a, a quick mnemonic to, to remember it. Um, press X to swap your brush colour over quickly. Um, and I'd already said that about the making sure your brackets are on the layer mask. So refining the, the layer mask is particularly good if you're dealing with hair and um, fine details, getting rid of um, halos, or if you've got a slightly bumpy selection, you can use the um, the smooth function to to deal with that. Um, and the downside of the the layer mask refine is it's not um, it's not non-destructive. Um, so when you do this 
if you do it wrong, make sure you control Z or control Alt Z and step back through and then redo it. Um, because if you keep doing it, you can actually end up losing some of that um, the detail that you'd already got in the mask. Um, and the smart radius and the ability to actually draw using this tool here around the edge can be really helpful for getting a very fine um, selection but there are times when nothing other than just a normal paintbrush um, and going in with a very fine paintbrush can can get rid of it as well um, and this is where it ended up with in the the overall picture this one was an absolute snot to try and um, deal with and I ended up using the magnetic lasso tool to to grab all these edges um, and pull them out but, um, and that's where they ended up fitting in the the original so I'm going to run a quick video here of how to use Lightroom and parts of this is sped up so this will give you an idea as to, to how the whole thing ties into itself Okay, so what we're going to do is have a look at a couple of images um, that we're going to put composite together. And of course the first thing to do is deal with the base image and make any changes that we're going to want to have happen to it. Um, so adjust the colour temperature, adjust the, the brightness, um, check out highlights. Yeah, there's a couple of blown ones on the um, car but I'm not too worried about them given that they're actually reflections so I'm going to ignore that um, grab the image that we're going to also use and sync which is synchronize the the settings between the two images and given that they were both taken on manual and no changes to the camera settings were done um, that means that the exposure and everything else is going to be the same when we bring them across and it just makes life a little bit easier from that point of view and the last thing we're going to need is the uh, if I go to it in a second ah, no we're not <laughs> um, we'll grab the grab the other image that uh, we're going to use for the shadow in a bit so open as smart objects in Lightroom uh, in Lightroom from Lightroom into Photoshop there's the image that we're going to use for the shadow and we'll open that one up in Photoshop as well alright so this is in Photoshop and they've both, oh, two of them have opened up anyway um, and we're just going to drag and drop the smart objects so that we've got the two layers which you can see down the left hand side close the other original, go back and grab the one that didn't quite open properly I don't know what I did there but never mind, tough luck um, and pop them in and obviously I'm not doing this at real speed because otherwise I think this whole task was about 20 minutes and um, we'll be sitting here for a while. Okay, so grab the selection tool and have a look at the background. Now in this case it's a fairly bumpy background and the magic wand isn't going to work and that's not going to help if I grab the magic wand a second time is it? Um, so let's grab the other selection tool and we can draw around that. Control D and on a PC also deselects when you've already got a pre-existing selection there and if you hold down Alt you can undo uh, previous selection like I'm doing there managed to select the head when I didn't intend to and layers, layer mask and we're going to hide selection so that's going to allow the background through next thing we want to do is fill up all the other areas with black uh, that we don't want now the photography view mode doesn't have the um, paint bucket tool so change modes drop it in there. You'll notice there's a small halo around the outside there where the selection, um, the automatic fill hasn't quite behaved itself so grab a brush run around that so we don't end up with that um, being a pain in the neck later. Go back to our normal view and then if you press the backspace key uh, you can come up with, uh, it will show that red mask and you can see what's actually selected and then there are a number of ways from here to clean up the rest of the mask. Obviously one of them is paintbrush and then we're going to clean up the area and this time we're going to use the magnetic lasso tool which sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't. If it doesn't, press the backspace and you can click on to force it to select a point or you can just keep dragging it around and it will select where it thinks it needs to go and it does a reasonable job. 
When it comes to doing straight lines though, it's often better to go to the straight lasso tool. So in this case I'm going to finish the selection, do the head, which of course is a little bit rounded, um, and paint in the that area that I've already got selected, grab the paintbrush and just clean up the couple of bits that I spotted. And sometimes I'll go around and clean everything up at the end, sometimes I'll do it as I'm going. Um, as I said, this is a nice straight piece, so let's deal with this with a different tool, um, just because it's a little bit easier to get your, your selection on the, the feet, um, at least Lego feet. Um, and then there's a little bit of a gap in here that there's we can see through to the concrete. Interestingly, there's also a reflection in there, so later on you'll probably notice that I end up getting a, um, a tool and darkening that area down to get rid of the um, existing reflection. Um, it's the easiest way of hiding it rather than trying to get in there and put the actual reflection of the car or anything silly in. Um, <coughs> sometimes the discretion is the better part of valor. So, pick it up, spin it round, maneuver them up and just position them where you're wanting that to go. I think my original plan was actually to put them on the other side, which is why I had the handout. I was going to have the hand resting on the car. And then I realised that wasn't going to work because of the position of the feet. Um, so he's going back down there. Such is life. Um, so refine mask, and this is a useful one for just sorting out any of those bumps um, on the legs where the the mask isn't quite as nice as it could be, so just use the smooth. And then I've um, just picked up that I hadn't done the other hand, so this is another way of doing it. And this is with just the paintbrush. And um, for a small piece like this, just grabbing a hard-edged paintbrush uh, can actually be quite a good way of, of dealing with it. And the nice thing about this is if you happen to miss and take a piece off that you shouldn't have, you can go back and change from black to white and paint the pieces back in. Um, so remember X will convert those two and i am just put a black and a white background in there just to make sure that I'm not there's nothing glaringly obvious that I've missed um, and it's just a, a new layer that I'm going to hide again and won't, won't end up being part of the final product but it's a nice quick way of checking what's going on Alright, so the other option is you can utilize the shadow um, from that previous shot. Uh, sorry, not utilize the shadow, but instead of going for the shadow, grab the outside outline of the person. Um, in this case, I've put the cardboard down, so I've got a reasonably clean outline um, to work with. It's not perfect, and there's bumps and things all over the place, so I'll need to go through and do a bit of cleanup. Um, but we're going to create a layer mask out of that hide the original layer in a second and fill the shadow layer with black so we can actually see what we're doing um, while we're cleaning it up and we should speed this up again it's one of those things that just takes time to get rid of bumps and um, bits and pieces and soften the edge just a little bit I started softening the edge of the the far end of it and then realize that actually I'm probably not going to be using that it's going to hide out the back of the image so let's never mind just give the the whole thing a little bit of a refine edge and um, and soften it so that it matches similar to what we've already got on the ground uh, it may well be that you want to do this after you've done the next step which is going to be um, using a curve to put it on but um, I've done this enough that I, I can work out what I'm going to have to clean up um, beforehand, some of the time at least. Um, so I'm going to change the blend mode to multiply and reduce the opacity. And that's getting, it's a quick rough and ready way of doing a shadow. It's um, not a bad way of getting it, but you can see there's a little bit of a color tone difference between the two. Um, the multiply version is a little bit on the bluey green side and it doesn't knock down the areas particularly that are highlighted. So we're going to apply that layer mask and move it to a curve um, tool and we can then grab these curves and start changing things around and change the, the colors particularly and give it a blue color cast. That's obviously going to be way too overcooked at the moment but um, 
you'll see as you go through that I get it refined back and closer and closer until hopefully by the end of it you actually can't tell the difference between the colour of that shadow that we've introduced and one of the original pre-existing ones. Um, and that's basically the, the idea of, of anything that you're doing with Photoshop. Uh, the, yes, you may have a, a Lego person in there, um, but you want people guessing whether or not they've actually you've gone and made a um, six foot Lego person or whether or not you've photoshopped it in and they shouldn't be able to tell the difference. <laughs> um, it reminds me of some actual ones on the beach in um, Europe and um, we can clean up the, the overlap. We don't want those shadows to get darker when they um, are overlapping because that's not what happens in real life. Um, and again a little bit more refining of the the shade to get those two to match. And then the final trick is to actually clone I'm going to blur out those edges first, um, but we to get rid of that a little bit of a um, of an overlap. The actual easiest way of dealing with it is to clone out in a new layer. The only downside to it is if you clone um, and then change anything to the shadow, you may end up um, with things showing up again. Uh, but it's, it's um, as long as this is one of your final steps then it's okay and you'll see that this is going on to a new layer so it's non-destructive again um, and if you need to go back and change it then you've still got all the data there which is a, a nice thing with Photoshop to be able to do that and blur that edge a little bit more and that's pretty much it Oh, I think I might have remembered something what was it? Ah yeah, the gap between the, um, the Legos man's feet um, and just grab a little bit more of a shadow in there darken it up and again this time we'll use that multiply um, and black um, option because it's not going to create a, enough of a, an area that's a noticeable difference one of the few times that I actually use an erase tool to get rid of some of the overlap and that's it done Okay, so that's all for that video. Um, hopefully you've found the the tutorials useful and so it's a, been a decent refresher for most of you um, from doing 106. And yeah, if you've got questions, um, then um, feel free to drop me a line. And um, obviously there'll be some, well, hopefully there'll be some of you watching this that, that are not doing the SIT course and um, maybe decide that you want to get in some practice and actually get on, get on and do this um, yourselves and it'd be lovely to see you. Um, so if you've got any questions you can feel free to drop me a, an email through or a message through um, YouTube. Alright, have a good one. Cheers.